all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fossone. I'm the officer of the deck today. We've got some great programs for you. I think you'll find very interesting. We always want to remind you, you can find more about Veterans Radio at its Facebook site or by going to veteransradio.net where we're on the web 24-7. You can find a lot of our podcasts there as well. We post new ones every Tuesday, so you can get a new story, a new interview, something you didn't know before by going to veteransradio.net. And before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. First up, we want to thank National Veteran Business Development Council, nvbdc.org. It was established to certify both service-disabled and veteran-owned businesses. You'll find out how they can help your business by going to nvbdc.org. We want to thank Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans fights for veterans' disability rights all across the nation. You can reach them at 800-693-4800 or on the web at legalhelpforveterans.com. We also want to thank our latest national sponsor, Veteran Lending Council. It is a community dedicated to educating lenders, realtors, and veterans on the VA Home Loan Benefit Program. You can check them out on Facebook and other social media outlets. We want to welcome to Veterans Radio today, Major Tom Schumann, United States Marine. Uh, Welcome, Tom, to Veterans Radio. Sir, thanks for having me. Well, Major, it is uh, an honor to actually have you here. Uh, We're going to talk about your background a little bit, um, what you're doing currently, but we want to talk about your uh, book, Always Faithful, that has just come out, uh, talking about your relationship with your uh, interpreter in uh, Afghanistan and all the efforts uh, that it took to get him into the United States, him and his family into the United States. Uh, so I think Always Faithful, which is one chapter written by the major, one chap- chapter written by the interpreter, uh, is a fascinating read. It uh, really paints a great picture. So, uh, Major, help me out. What's, uh, what is the interpreter's proper pronunciation of his name? So we just call him Zach, but uh, Zanula, Zanula Zaki is his full name. But I'm, he, uh, you know, all, all, all the interpreters kind of uh, picked up a nickname at some point, and you know, Zaki just went, became Zach, and so we, we've always called him Zach. And that's what I'm going to refer to him as. Uh, He's currently in Texas with his family, working in the construction field. Um, But we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that progress to get here. But let's start with this, Major. How did a how did a nice kid like you from Chicago, who who describes his mother as a hippie turned cop, end up in the Marine Corps? Yeah, there's there's this idea of a uh, a rational call to service and uh I, I did not grow up playing with gi joes or watching you know apocalypse now or anything like that you know i wasn't uh don't have a rich family history of service uh, and really it never crossed my mind until uh i was a sophomore in high school and then it all of a sudden did uh service i, I when, when 9 11 happened i knew i would serve at that point, if you asked me what were the branches of service, I probably couldn't have told you all the branches. I could have probably said there's an army and navy and maybe an air force. Uh, I, it, it was it, that, that's where that uh, seed was planted. I, I also felt a sense of civic duty in that uh, my mom uh, never graduated high school and she worked really hard and made some significant sacrifices and provided me opportunities that she could have never afforded for for herself. And uh, I think there's something special about that in this country that, that through some hard work and through some sacrifice, you can pass something on to, to the next generation. And so I wanted to pay into that. So maybe a little bit of, uh, a lot of bit of 9-11 and a little bit of sense of civic duty to, to pay into something. And, and uh, 
how did I end up in the Marines? Uh, I went to a little ROTC boot camp week and I saw the sailors and I saw the Marines and I said, I like those guys better. <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's how I ended up being a Marine. Well, it, it's, uh, you know, somewhat, uh, as I often find in talking to guys, happens this way in that uh, you now have uh, this, you have a master's in English literature from Georgetown University, and what are you doing now? You're teaching at the U.S. Naval Academy. Who would have thought this uh, uh, duty that you, service you went into, would have ended, had you end up there? Yeah, they say, you know, grunts or whatever, crans. I don't like all those kind of... Uh... I think those those are those are false uh, reads on on the status of, of Marines. I think Marines, maybe more than, and I'm obviously biased, but any other service really puts a premium on education. And uh, af- after Georgetown and after teaching at the Naval Academy, the Marine Corps just sent me to an, another graduate program at the Naval War College where I, I studied uh, national defense and security. So. The Marine Corps sent me to three different universities to get two different degrees over a four-year period. It's, uh, I, I think, the value and the premium of having a lethal mind and, and developing critical thinkers is, is is a high priority in the Corps. And but it's definitely not something I could have ever, you know, in 2010 when I was in saying, and if you said, do you think someday you'll be a literature teacher at the Naval Academy? I would have looked at you like you're crazy, but. Uh, that, that, yep, that's what happened. Well, and who would have thought you would have ever been an author of a book? And the way this is constructed is sort of chapter by chapter. Uh, the major writes one, Zach writes one. And so when you're telling the audience about um, your growing up in Chicago, Zach is telling the audience in his chapter about growing up in Afghanistan and so you get this uh, very, in my mind, very eye-opening view of what Afghanistan was like in in years before Americans were there, when the Russians were there. As you went back and forth and ping pong these chapters, uh, Major, was that sort of uh, eye-opening and surprising for you as well? Uh, the the alter uh, the alternating narrative structure of the story, I think, is critical and, and central. And you know. I, I would have never written a book without Zach. I, I, I don't, I don't think, you know, the world needed another guy who spent a, a year or two in Afghanistan to tell you what Afghanistan was all about. I, I, I always felt convicted that uh, we needed to have Zach's voice in this. And, uh, and, and fortunately we had a publisher that, that supported that idea. And I did, I spent 17 months in Afghanistan. I know just a little bit about it and a little bit about the people, a little bit about the culture, but I, I have friends that I made there who were, were born there. And, and, and so I, I've, I've had an opportunity over the last decade to learn uh, a little bit more about the country, but uh, undoubtedly Zach's uh, writing and chapters were illuminating uh, to me. And, and I didn't know many of the stories uh, that are, that he shares in his chapters. So it was, it was definitely uh, eye opening. Um, as I as he and I collaborated on, on the book. Well, and that's why one of the reasons I would recommend this to the veteran radio listeners, uh, I told uh, the major before we get on that this was one of my top two favorite books of the year. And this getting Zach's view of Afghanistan before, while the Russians were there and before the Americans get there and while the Americans get there and why he makes the choices he makes to serve uh, Tom just explained why he made some decisions to serve, but tell us uh, a little bit about why Zach decided to serve as an interpreter for the Americans. Yeah, Zach felt that uh, he wanted to see a prosperous and more free Afghanistan. Zach's family is, you know, valued education, valued, uh, you know, some of the freedoms that they have, and they felt that the Taliban was a oppressive, restrictive regime and uh and and he saw america as a country that was in fact there to help the afghanistan people uh and he just like anybody's kind of called a service he felt like hey i have i have a civic duty to to improve my country and this is the best means of doing that is to to, to become allies with with the u.s forces and so yeah i mean everybody's trying to make uh, the the place and their future a little bit brighter for their kids and for their family and, and Zach saw that uh, they maybe 
joining with the coalition was 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 how he can contribute. Yeah, you really got that sense in reading his chapters, and uh, as I say, it sort of mirrored some of the things in a different way that, you know, hey, I'm serving for this reason, he's serving for that reason. But you find yourself in Afghanistan in the Helmand River Valley in 2010 in really some um, horrific times, and you uh, you were with uh, the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, uh, affectionately known as the Dark Horse Battalion. And, and unfortunately, 25 Marines died during that period, and a couple of hundred uh, were wounded. So you were really in the crucible uh, here, and, and Zach becomes your interpreter, and a, and a brotherhood or a bondship really develops that each of you talk about in your respective chapters. Can you talk a little bit about that uh, bond that uh, developed between you and Zach as an interpreter, but really much more? Sure. Most, uh, I went back to Afghanistan as a, as, with recon and as a JTAC and as an advisor. So I've worked with dozens of interpreters and, and most of them do their job and they translate, you know, and, and I, and that's fine. That's what they're paid to do. They're paid to translate. Whereas Zach was never there just to translate. He could, and he could do that job well, but he, he, he was, you know, when we had guys who were wounded, he was going to pick up a rifle. When, when he heard the Taliban coordinating ambush, he sprints across a, a, a minefield and tackles the guy who's about to initiate the ambush. Uh, he, and, and, and Zach also became a, just a, kind of a confidant uh, of, of mine in that you, you, you can't uh, gripe down. You, know, you, you can't pass on your anxieties or your stresses as a commander down to your troops. You, you can only kind of uh, send those messages up. And there wasn't really a whole, everybody was really kind of struggling with all the same stuff. And, and so Zach became a person who I can kind of confide in and was able to kind of console me. And, and, and really, um, he, he pretty quickly went from, you know, being our translator uh, to, to being one of us and, and to kind of uh, absolutely being one of the Marines and, and, and part of the Brotherhood. Well, and it, I think we all know that two people can observe the same event and have them much different story about that event and again in in these chapter by chapter analysis it's v- really riveting and very informative to get your view of a particular event in afghanistan and then get zach's view and, and it, he's always approaching it also with that that love of country that you mentioned that that you know afghanistan is really his home and he has a uh, I'll call it a bias uh, uh, in favor of what's going on and how beautiful the country is. I, I have to imagine that your conversations with Zach as you were building the relationship touched on all of these areas, not just the horrors of war, but but culture and the nature and the beauty of Afghanistan. Yeah, I, I mean, w- when you talk to Zach about his home province of Kunar, I mean, he, he talks about I, I, I mean, think of your favorite place in this country or, or your favorite mem- memories. And I mean, he doesn't talk about Afghanistan like the general perception of Afghanistan as a war torn or what. I mean, he talks of it very fondly. And, and uh, you know, the fall of Afghanistan, he, he and I did an interview recently and, and I hadn't heard him say this, but he said that that was the worst day of my life. And that really hit me and and i mean this is a guy who loved his country loves his culture uh loved where he grew up and was proud of where he grew up and uh you know you can get him talking about uh, kunar river and and going fishing there and going to get ice cream and and like you know all, all the kind of things that we admired and had fun during while we grew up and uh it is it, it is it is devastating to think of uh, where that country's at now and, and, and the poverty and the, and, and the abject kind of, uh, oppression that, that, that's occurring. So yeah, it's, 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 it's tough. Well, you, and that's what you get out of the book, always faithful, uh, which is out now under the, uh, William Morrow imprint. It, it is that, uh, getting, getting a, a native Afghans view along with, 
this uh, Marine military officer's view that I think that makes the, the book so fascinating to read and, and quick to read. Um, but you, you left uh, uh, Zach as the interpreter for your unit back in, I think it was about uh, 2010. And, and it's now another decade before the fall of Afghanistan and the plight of Zach and his, his wife and his kids that is the you know, back third, if you will, of, of the book. Um, did you have communication with him during that uh, decade period? Yeah, I, I mean, I was back in Afghanistan fighting a, a year later. Um, he went and started to support uh, different Army SF units and some CAA guys in his province. And so we were both pretty busy still working in the war. Uh, but we, we stayed friends through Facebook. And then uh, about 2014, 15 time frame, we really started kind of talking almost every every week. And then uh, 2015 is when he started to approach me about applying for a special immigration so visa and, and we spent the next uh, six years working on that visa application so yeah we, we always maintain communication and maintain friendship uh, you know we during this period we became husbands and dads and so we would always talk about family and how things are going but there was always a very underlying you know stress that Zach was being persecuted and, and he was being hunted and by the Taliban for his service to the U.S. And so that was always something that would bubble up in our conversations is, is that reality as we tried to do what we could to, to move his visa application along over a very, very long period. And that's explained in the book in concrete terms about the messages that were left and, and you know, uh, things that happened at, the, at his house that were attributable to the Taliban that we know who you are, we know what you did, we know where you live. That was sort of the message, wasn't it? Correct. I, I mean, in, in the ES, like you said, it's in no uncertain terms, they're, they're leaving night letters at his father's house saying, we're, we're hunting for you, and when we find you, we're, we're going to kill you. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the thing about Zach's service is not only was he so heroic when he was allied with us, he was then persecuted to the point that he couldn't leave his village. I mean, for, for after he, after the army left uh, Kunar in 2014, he could not leave his village without fear of being murdered, and and he couldn't work anymore without fear of being killed. And uh, that 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 is a I I can't imagine what that stress must feel like to to be under constant persecution for something that you did that was noble and virtuous. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, he, that, was a, that was a very real threat. Well, as you mentioned, it took six years to work on a visa to get him uh, and his family ultimately out of Afghanistan. And all, during that whole period, these threats were going on. And obviously we get to uh, the fall, uh, the summer of 2021, and the U.S., uh, beginning in the spring, is talking about we're pulling out. Um, how did that ramp up your anxiety and stress and his about are we going to be able to pull this off? And and talk to us a little bit about how the hell did you pull it off? Yeah. Uh, it's a simple message. When the president made the announcement, I said, what does that mean to you uh, that, that we'll be gone? in a couple months. And he said, uh, I will certainly be killed by the Taliban. And I said, okay, well, I'm going to get to work. And so I started a, uh, I had a, I had a decent social media following. And so I started a guerrilla marketing campaign and I just put an appeal out there and I said, Hey, it was a one minute video. I just said, here's Zach. Uh, here's what we've been working on trying to get his visa. And, and here's the threat. Like, if you think you can help, let me know. And, and it caught fire and it, and it built momentum and there's no shortage of people who wanted to help. Uh, everybody from Senator Durbin talking to Secretary Blinken during a confirmation hearing about Zach, uh, Secretary Blinken saying that he was going to make sure that that was all taken care of, you know, so when, when you've got the Secretary of State saying, um, we're, we're on it, you know, uh, we, we, we land on the New York uh, Times front cover, we're, we're on primetime TV and, and all these people are all throwing their weight behind this. And so we feel like even though the situation is desperate and Zach had to 
flee Kunar to Kabul and that things in Kabul are very uh, touch and go. And, and then over, you know, within hours, the Taliban, Kabul collapses and the government. And, and so we really had this sense of urgency. But but we keep kind of thinking that the system is, is maybe going to come through, that the system might still deliver what it, it promised. And uh, after three very harrowing uh, attempts of, of getting him through the gate at the airport on the third attempt, uh, it just took a personal friend of mine who I'd met at basic training and, and, and he jumped the wall and, and grabbed Zach and his family. But uh, each attempt was dramatic and dangerous and people were killed all around them each time. And he's got four little kids that are all under the age of six and, to be dragging his kids into this environment every time. And it was, it was a ton of courage by his children, a ton of courage by his wife and just total resolve and resiliency by Zach to kind of see this through. And then a couple of great Americans out there holding the line, second time, first Marines, first battalion, eighth Marines holding the line in this impossible situation. And then a friend of mine, Jared, uh, who ended up being an air force pilot and he's the one that goes in and plucks him out. So, uh, yeah, it was, it, we, we not, I wish we didn't have a dramatic, you know, ending. I wish it was just, uh, Hey, your paperwork got approved and you got on a flight and everything was, you know, but it, it's not how it turned out. And, uh, the system never delivered. And, and it was through just a lot of through personal heroism and courage that we were able to, to get back out. Well, and, and fortuitous, you happen to know somebody standing at the gate, uh, I mean, uh, if you couldn't have placed that phone call and gotten the right guy in the right spot, the third attempt might not have worked. He would not have gotten out. He would have been like the other 90-something percent of SIV applicants who did not get out. So it didn't matter that you're on the New York Times. It didn't matter that Secretary Blinken said, oh, yeah, we'll take care of it. None of, the, none of that part of the system actually came through and almost by, as I say, for it's fortuitous, it's almost an accident, serendipity that you're able to connect some dots and, and make, it, make it work. As you look back on it, uh, Major, I'm going to ask you what failed, but I don't think it's fair for me to maybe ask you that question since you're wearing the uniform. But I guess I'm looking at it and say, damn, the system just failed there. It, it failed for a lot of people. And... Uh, you know, I don't know that any blame has been pointed out. If any reports, uh, Congress has issued, uh, you know, some investigative reports, so we learn from our mistakes and it has, will never happen again. Has anything come yeah. out of that? Is, is there such a, hey, we, we did an after action report and we're not going to make this mistake again? Well, there, 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 if there hasn't, there, there must be that. And, and, and to your point, I mean, the, the, bureaucracy was simply insurmountable and it was shocking that it was that you could have people in the highest levels of government and the military and the media and this did not it never moved it did not move one percent through the system even with all that support and, and to me that was i could not believe uh that nothing literally nothing could move that needle. And so that was, was jarring no, no, undoubtedly. And, and, and we betrayed our allies. We, we, we made a promise to people and we didn't, as, as a nation, we didn't uphold that promise. And, and we, and we, we owe it to our future allies uh, to, to really take a hard look at, at how, how did that come to be? And, and how can we make sure, like you said, that that's never repeated because if, if we're not a country who keeps our promises, you know, what are we, you know, we, we lack honor, we lack integrity. We've we got to keep our promises. And so we must look at this critically and, and take some lessons away for sure. Well, well said major. I, I want you to just talk a little bit about the journey then Zach and his family had to make to get to the United States. And even once in the United States, the journey they had to get, go through to get to sort of, I guess I'll call it more normal living, um, because I yeah, think was, I think a lot of people wouldn't understand. Oh, you, he he got on a plane. He got out of uh, uh, Karzai Airport. All good. No, that's not the end of the story, is it? No, 
Uh, that was really just the beginning of another story. Uh, he, he ended up in Qatar for a long time. Um, then he went to Germany, spent months in uh, Germany under some pretty tough conditions there in Germany. Flew into Philadelphia, flew from Philadelphia to a refugee camp in Virginia. Spent several months in a refugee camp in Virginia. Had been promised that he would be relocated to San Antonio to join his cousins, which was really important to him to help him um, assimilate. He, he really wanted to go to San Antonio because he had family there. Uh, kind of completely uh, without notice, gets sent to uh, Minnesota in the middle of January. Uh, what basically 24 hour notice, Hey, you're not going to Texas. You're going to Minneapolis. And he's like, where's Minneapolis? And he finds out it's pretty, it's a pretty cold place in January. Uh, and it was at that point that I flew out there to, to finally see him. And, uh, I said, Hey, you, know, you want to get to Texas? And he said, absolutely. <laughs> and so I said, let's do it. And so with, without, we didn't have a plan when I showed up, I just, I booked the flight that night, and then the next day, we had uh, seven passengers, eight bags, and four car seats uh, with a stop in Denver, and uh, we finally got him into into San Antonio, which was a really kind of special uh, special thing to to see him finally with his family and, and getting settled. So it was, it was definitely quite a quite a journey. Yeah, it, it is a second part of the story that uh, you don't want to lose sight of. And I really uh, enjoyed Always Faithful, a story of the war in Afghanistan, the fall of Kabul, and the unshakable bond between a Marine and an interpreter. Uh, Major Tom Schumann, we appreciate you taking some time today to tell your story and Zach's story, and I highly recommend this book to everybody. Uh, uh, Tom, where might they find copies of this book or track what's going on relative to it? And sounds like it ought to be a movie, and t so sort of give us how to keep in touch on this. Sure. It, it might be a movie. There is a screenplay that Bob wrote at wrote, the guy who wrote Sam Pride Ryan, so we'll see what happens there. Uh you can get the book, you can pre-order the book now and anywhere. So whether you've got your favorite local bookstore, uh, you'll be able to order it through them, Barnes and Noble, Amazon. And then, uh, yeah, I, I think anywhere you'd normally would find a book, it, it should be listed. Well, we appreciate the time you've given us today. Uh, go back and teach those uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Naval Academy cadets something this summer. And uh, everything that you've told us in this book and Zach has told us in this book, I really think adds to a better understanding of what it was like for the interpreters, the Afghan families, and and um, what it takes sometimes to keep our promises. Uh, Major uh, Schumann, uh, gr great, uh, great work here. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you for having me on. And I want to thank everybody for listening to Veterans Radio today. I am Jim Fawson. It's been a pleasure to be your host. I'm a veterans disability lawyer at Legal Help for Veterans, and you can reach us at 800-693-4800 or legalhelpforveterans.com on the web. You can follow Veterans Radio on Facebook and listen to its podcasts and Internet radio shows by going to veteransradio.net. And until next time, you are dismissed. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans' Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans' Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. We again want to thank our national sponsors, the National Veterans Business Development Council, nvbdc.org, VA Ann Arbor Health Care System, the Vietnam Veterans of America, Charles S. Kettle's Chapter, Ann Arbor, Michigan. VFW Graf O'Hara Post 423 in Ann Arbor. And the American Legion Press Corn Post 46, also in Ann Arbor. And the Veterans Lending Council, which advises lenders, realtors, buyers about VA Home Loan Program, and you can find them on Facebook. We appreciate all your support. You can go to veteransradio.net, click on the sponsor level, and continue to support keeping Veterans Radio on the air. And until next time, you are 
dismissed. Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.